right, Coder, cue up the electric bass because it is time to bring on the funk. We're going to learn about functions in Swift. So Swifters, I've got you are awesome up. We're going to be working in viewcontroller.swift. We'll skip over to the playground for a little bit, but let's first talk functions. Now, functions are reusable chunks of code to perform a particular task. And Apple gives us some functions, but we can also write our own. And that's what we're going to learn to do in this video. To give you a sense of what we've been using, view did load is an apple function this is something that's given to us by apple and it's called automatically when the view loads now we also wrote our own function when we control dragged over from the interface builder canvas the outline of the function was given to us by xcode but we populated it with all this code inside now there are also functions that were created as part of different objects such as types these are referred to as methods you'll see the words methods and function used interchangeably the m that we see in code completion for example after a pen shows up in dot notation says hey this is a method or a function that can be applied to this particular array even the functions that we're writing inside of our view controller code those are technically considered to be methods of the view controller class so all methods in swift are functions if you ever see a little m just know that that's a function you might even find it useful to think of functions as the verbs in your program. Do something like do this code when a button is pressed or do this code when the name of the function appears inside my program. Why do we use functions? Well, they are hugely helpful. One of the most important concepts in computer science. They help us organize our code. They make our code easier to maintain because if you've got a chunk of code that does one thing, then you know all of your maintenance needs to happen in that one thing. Functions make our code reusable. So instead of having to repeat ourselves, we can go ahead and just call a function. It makes our program smaller and more efficient. Now, this is how you write a function. Start with the keyword func and then give it a name. A good name might describe the action taking place like message button pressed or view did load. Then this name you give the function is always followed by two parentheses. Now we'll learn you can put things inside the parentheses to pass values into the function. You'll eventually learn that you can return results from functions too, but at a minimum that's not necessary. And then the statements that you execute when you call a function are inside of the curlies. How do you call the function once you've defined it? You simply use the name in your code. You'll follow it with the parentheses and eventually you'll learn that if you're passing inputs in, you'll put them in here too. Let's write our first function. Now, one of the things that we mentioned we can do with functions is we can organize our code a bit better. So if we go through the logic of our code, we see that our message button press function is getting bigger. So we've got some information here for displaying messages, for displaying images, and then we got all this stuff that's specific to playing a sound. Let's create a function called play sound that we can use to hold these lines and then just call play sound in here. This will make our code a little bit more organized, easier to read, and if we ever wanna make changes to play sound, and we will in just a bit, we can zone right in on that play sound function. So first, how do we define a function? Well, we use the keyword func. You wanna pay attention to where you write your function. You never wanna write your function inside of another function. So I'm typing here right after view did load, the closing curly for that function, and before the definition of message button pressed. This is a good place for it too. Most people leave view did load as the first function in their view controller code, and they put all their actions toward the bottom of their view controller code. So now after the keyword func, we give this function a name. Play sound is a good name. We can see that the name is not reserved as a keyword because it's not showing up in code completion, and that's good. We wouldn't want to try to use a function name that Apple was already using. Now, initially I'm not going to pass anything into the play sound function, so I use open and close parentheses, then I start with my curlies. Now I define the function first because then it'll show up in code completion if I ever call it. Now down here, I'm going to grab these lines of code that play my sound, so the whole if statement that I created in the previous video. And I'm going to command X to cut it, then I go up to the curlies for play sound and I paste the code in there. And now this code will only be executed, the play sound code that we wrote, when we call it. Where do we want to call it? Well, it used to live down here inside of message button pressed. So I'm going to go over here and just type in, if I start to type in play sound, watch what happens as code completion thinks. Xcode knows play sound exists because we just defined it as a function. The little M that you see over to the left stands for method, which is a function. So if we press return, we'll accept this. And now what's going to happen when we run our code is every time we press the button, our code will execute from the top all the way down here. When it hits this line play sound, it will do this little jump up here and execute everything inside the curlies. When it's done executing all these things, it'll hop down here and then technically our function is done, ready to run the next time you click the button. Now we also spoke about events and we said view did load was a system event. That's called by the operating system when the view controller loads for the first time. And message button pressed is a user event. This is an IB action that we created. Well, what's play sound? Play sound is what's often called a helper function. 
it helps out. In this particular case, it wasn't entirely necessary, but it certainly makes our code a lot better. And we'll see how we can even improve this. For now, let's go ahead, build and run, and see how things look. So here we are. We're not expecting anything different from the previous time we ran our code. Yeah, let's start yeah, clicking the button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, everything's looking normal. Let's head back over to Xcode so we can learn more about functions. Now, one thing we haven't done yet is we haven't modified our code so that we can play different sounds. If we take a look, the function that we wrote will only play sound zero. Now, it would be nice if we could pass in different sound names and then play that sound. Now, it is possible, as we'd mentioned, to pass parameters or values into functions and have the functions take advantage of those. In fact, we've already been using that. In our previous video where we worked with stack views, we also created an app that was able to read the tag parameter that was passed in from the sender argument. Well, sender is just an argument in this function that accepts a value coming in from the button that clicked on it. So we're going to do something very similar. We're going to pass in a different string to be used as a file name to play that sound. Now, before we get there, why don't we set up a new playground and we'll experiment with passing values into functions. So I'm going to head up under the file menu and I'm going to say new playground. It'll be a blank iOS playground. I'll save it to the desktop and I'll call it functions. I'll double click to expand to full screen and I can get rid of the str variable. Now, why don't we take some of the code we'd used previously and turn that into functions. If you want, you can open up the old playground where you had your while and repeat loops, and you can copy the code that we use to determine how many times you've got to roll a dice before a six shows up. I'm just going to type in that code right now and speed up the video. So I'll say var dice roll colon int to declare but not initialize the variable. It's going to hold our dice roll. Var number of rolls equals zero to count our dice rolls. Repeat. And inside the repeat curly, it's going to type in dice roll equals int dot random in one dot 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 six to roll from one to six. I'll increment number of rolls to one with number of rolls plus equals one. Then I'll have a print line that says print roll number string interpolation number of rolls was a string interpolation dice rolls. And then in the while condition of the repeat loop, I'll say while dice roll does not equal six. And then when this while condition fails, I'll continue down and I'll print out it took number of rolls dice rolls to roll a six. Then I'll run my code first time. It only takes me one dice roll. Second time, it takes me six dice rolls. Great. Now let's put this in a function. So I'm going to go up here before all of our code, and I'm going to define the function. So I'm going to say func number of times to roll six. Open and close parenthesis, open and close curly, and then take all of my code in here. And since I'm using these variables inside of the function, I want to make sure they're defined inside the function too. So I'll command X, paste these guys in here, and now I should be able to call this function. So I'm going to say number of times, and notice since I define the function, it shows up as an F here, and in playgrounds it shows up as an F instead of an M, and I can do this over and over again. So if I want to do it three times in a row, let's see how things look. So let's see, I should have this executing three times, and I see the first time it took me five rolls, the second time it took me four rolls, the third time it took me 15 rolls. Hey, that's pretty cool. Now let's improve our code. We'll modify this function for the number of times to roll a six, and we'll change it to accept a value so that we can determine the number of times to roll any number on a six-sided dice. I'm gonna copy this function up here, paste it down below, I'm going to comment out these three calls here just so that they don't print out. And note, now that I've commented out these function calls, this function code will never run. I've defined the function, but I've never called it. And so now I'm going to change the name of this function to number of times to roll, and I'm going to pass in a parameter. So I'm going to type that in between the parentheses, and I'll say number colon int. That means that when I call this function in between the parentheses, I can pass in any integer value. That integer value goes into this thing called number, which is a constant that I can use anywhere in my function code. So now let's look at the while condition of the repeat loop. This is where we said while dice roll does not equal six. Well, instead, let's put in while dice roll does not equal number. So now I can pass in any number, and that's going to create the condition where we stop the repeat loop. And just to check our type, why don't we option click on top of number, and it says, yes, number is an int, and it's also defined as a let constant. Also down here in the print statement, I'm going to say instead of it took number of rolls, dice rolls to roll a six, I'll do string interpolation over the six and put number in here too. So now watch as I start to type in NUMB, I can see both functions that I've defined are in here. And even though I haven't called a number of times to roll a six, it's still in here. I also see this other one though, which is number of times to roll the one that I just did. And it lists the parameter that I'm passing in here, the argument number. And it says, hey, this thing has got to be of type int. So I'm going to press enter and accept this and I'll pass in a one 
then I'll call the function again, but pass in a three, and I'll call the function a third time, and I'll pass in a five. Let's run and see the results. It took three dice rolls to roll a one, it took one dice roll to roll a three, and it took three dice rolls to roll a five. Excellent! And now let's just make sure that we know what's going on here. So when number of times to roll is called, and we pass in one for the number argument here, we go up to execute the function, number inside of this function immediately becomes one. We use one in place of number in the while condition, so we'll continue to go through the repeat loop until it is no longer true that dice roll doesn't equal one. So essentially when the dice roll is one, we drop out of the repeat loop, and then we use number again down in the print statement. So the code we've written tells us how many times it takes to roll a particular number on a six-sided dice. Let's copy the function, modify it, and add a parameter to it so that not only do we look for a particular number that's rolled, but we can also change the number of sides on the dice. Throw back to Dungeons and Dragons days. So I copy the function. I'm going to put in a comment up top that says that this is a one parameter function. Now I'm going to go down here and I'm going to put in another comment that says I'm about to add a two parameter function. I'm going to highlight and comment out the three function calls I just made, and I'll paste my function below. Now there is something interesting about Swift as I define this. I'm currently getting a message that says I'm redeclaring the same function here. Now I could do a couple of things. I could give the function a different name, but in Swift I can keep the function's name the same as long as the number of parameters are different. Swift will consider those to be two separate functions and they'll allow those two functions to exist even though they have the same name. So let's just keep the name of the function the same and see what happens in code completion. So I'm going to put in a second parameter. The way you put in more than one parameters in here is you put a comma after the first one, give the parameter a name, we'll call it dice sides, and then colon the type, which will be int. And now that I have a dice sides parameter, think about where we want to change that. Oh, I know, down here where I do my dice roll as an int of 1 to 6, well I want to do it as an int from 1 to whatever dice sides is. And let's modify this print condition so we say not only it took number rolls dice roll to roll a number, we'll say on a string interpolation dice sides, sided dice. So now that our code is getting a little bit more complex, there's one other thing we're going to need to check for. So the code that we've written is going to work fine as long as somebody puts in numbers that should roll properly. But imagine somebody rolls and says they uh, want to see how many times it takes to roll a 10 on a six-sided dice. Well, that test condition will never be satisfied because when we roll, we're going to do a random to the number of sides in the dice. But when we go down in the test condition, we're checking to see when dice roll is not equal to a number that's bigger than a number that we can roll. That would create an infinite loop, a condition where our program never stops and never gets to the conclusion we would be forever trapped in this function. So let's put in an if condition to prevent this error from happening. So let's write this as an if else statement. We'll do the true condition first. So if number less than or equal to dice sides, then we can take all the code we've written down here, the repeat through the print, cut it out and put it in between the curlies for the true condition. Else, open curlies, We'll never execute our repeat loop. We'll never print out any of the statements in the true condition. We'll never roll the dice. We'll simply print out, hey, you can't roll a string interpolation number on a string interpolation dice size sided dice. Now underneath the function, I'm going to call it a few times and then watch what happens with code completion as I start to type in the name of the function. I'll type in number, code completion pops up, and look, I have those two functions as number of times to roll. So because I've got two different parameters in here, Swift will consider those to be two separate functions and they can exist even though they have the same name. So I'm going to select this first one here that's got two parameters in it and you see how our definition is different. It's got both of those in there, number and dice sides, both as ints. Cool. Press return. Xcode conveniently highlights the first parameter. I'll type in a six. Then I can press the tab key to get to the second parameter. Xcode will highlight it automatically. I'll type in a 10 and I'll call the function three more times. So number of times to roll number two, dice sides four. How about number 15, dice sides 20? And then one where it should fail. So I'll say number 10, dice side six. So you can never roll a 10 on a six sided dice. I'm gonna do shift enter. Let's see the results. And when we take a look, it says it took us nine dice rolls to roll a six on a 10-sided dice. It took us six dice rolls to roll a two on a four-sided dice. It took us six rolls to roll a 15 on a 20-sided dice. And hey, you can't roll a 10 on a six-sided dice. Nice, everything is working perfectly. Now, just to show you, we were passing in literal values here, but you can pass in variables, constants. You can even perform a calculation and pass that in as well. As long as the parameter has the same value, and in our case, it wants ints for both of these, it will work. Let me show you some examples. I'll create two constants. One I'll say let first value equals seven. The second one I'll say let sided dice equals eight. So then we'll say number of times to roll a first value, which is a seven, 
dice sides equals eight. Then down below, what I'll do is I'll copy the same line and I'll multiply sided dice by two. Then do a shift enter and we get results for both of these. The first result we're looking at is how many times it takes to roll a seven on an eight sided dice. And the second one says how many times it takes to roll a seven on a 16 sided dice, because that's what we did when we multiplied sided dice, which is eight times two. So we're looking good. We've learned how to pass values in. There's one other thing I want us to learn in this video, which is how we pass values out. And in Swift, we say a function that passes a value out has a return value. So let's show an example. Now, as we do this example, why don't we go ahead and leverage some of the code that we've written? So I've pulled up my for loops playground, and I'm going to grab this little chunk of code where we calculate the average of an array of quiz scores. So I'm going to highlight this, Command C, head back over to the playground we were working on, and Command V and paste it in there. So we're going to use this code to write a function, and this function is going to be called quiz average, and it's going to accept an array of doubles. Those are going to be our quiz values. So I'm going to type in func quiz average, then in parentheses here for my parameter, I'm going to say quizzes colon bracket double close bracket. That's because this function is going to accept an array of doubles, and inside the function, we're going to refer to it as quizzes. The next thing I'm gonna do is this part that allows us to return a value. So in the definition of the function, I'm gonna type space dash greater than symbol space. See how it looks like an arrow? Now, right after this, I'm gonna put the type of the value that we're going to return, which is gonna be a double. That's gonna be the type of our result, the value that we return, which is gonna be the average of that array of doubles. Then I'll do an open and close curly, now I'm going to highlight this quiz averaging code that I wrote before, highlighting everything except for where I declare and initialize this variable called quizzes. I don't need that because I'm going to be passing an array of doubles into this function. Then I'm going to go up in between the function's curlies and paste in what I just cut. And now let's modify this code to work for the function. Now we see that we're getting an error down here. It says missing return in a function expected to return a double. Now Xcode knows that it's expected to return a double because when we wrote our function definition, we drew the arrow and then we put the word double afterward. So any function that has an arrow and it's returning a type needs to have the word return in there and it needs to return a value of that type. So what we're going to do is we're just going to write in return right after the curly for the for loop because at that point we'll be able to calculate our result and I'm going to copy out the equation that we had previously printed which is sum divided by double quizzes dot count now that I've got this in here I can actually cut out this print statement I don't want that inside of my function and in fact I'll get rid of that print statement completely I don't need it now I'll create some arrays that represent the quiz scores that students earned in this class I'll take this array called quizzes and I'm going to change the name to Sarah quizzes down below, I'll create John quizzes and I'll give them Sarah's quiz values, but I'll lower each one by 10 points. And I'll create Jess quizzes for a student named Jess who has the scores 90, 100, 94, 97, and 95. And now let's try out some different ways that we can call this function. So first I'll create a constant to hold Sarah's average. I'll say let Sarah average equals, I'll call my function quiz average. And for the quizzes value, I'm gonna put in Sarah quizzes. And on the next line, I'll say print Sarah's average is string interpolation Sarah average. On the next line, I'm going to say print John's average is, and then I'll do string interpolation and inside the string interpolation, and you can totally do this, I'm going to enter the name of this function that gives us a return value, quiz average. And for the quizzes parameter, I'm going to pass in John's quizzes. Now, because this returns a double value, that's what I'm going to get in here. And that's what's going inside of my string interpolation. The next line I'm gonna put in let Jess average equals quiz average with Jess quizzes and I'll print Jess's average is Jess average. So now let's go ahead and calculate a class average that's gonna be an average of the average of the student scores. So I'm gonna create a constant that says let class quizzes equals and then inside brackets, since what I want this to be is a collection of those individual doubles, one for each student average, I'm gonna put in Sarah average, comma, and now watch what I'm going to do for John. I'm going to type in quiz average, and then inside I'm going to pass in John's quizzes. So what this is going to do is it's going to give me back a double that I'm going to put in here as well, and then I'll say comma, Jess average, and close with a bracket. And now let's double check the types of the thing that we just created. If we option click on top of Sarah average, we can see Sarah average is a double because we got that back from the function. Here's a call to the function for quiz average. You can option click on a function name as well. And when we do this, we get the declaration of the function and we see it returns a double. So there's gonna be a double here. And Jess average of course is if we option click on it, a double. So we got three doubles separated by commas inside of brackets. So what do you think class quizzes is? Option click, it is an array of double, which is precisely what we can pass in to our function to get an average of these values. Let's do that. And then down below, we'll just say print the class quiz average is, and inside the string interpolation, I'm just gonna put in quiz average, 
and we'll pass into that function class quizzes, which is an array of doubles made up of the average of previous arrays of doubles. Now let's do a shift enter and see the results that we come up with. And we get Sarah's average, John's average, Jess's average, and the class quiz average. Outstanding. Now it's time for the moment of truth. We're back in ViewController.Swift. Can we use what we've learned about functions to improve our code? You know what? And before we get there, why don't we go ahead and update what we've written so far about our sounds? So here's challenge number one. And actually, it doesn't involve a function. Now, we want to do what we've done for messages and images, also for sound. So the code that I've highlighted here will generate a new non-repeating message number. And this code down here represents a new non-repeating image number. Now we haven't done anything with the sound numbers yet, but write code to generate a non-repeating sound number. And remember, if you go over to our assets catalog, you can take a look at how many files you've got. I happen to have six sounds in here, labeled from sound zero to sound five. I want you to write the code that will generate that non-repeating sound number, but for now, don't worry about playing the new sound. Just generate a non-repeating number that you can use in your sound name, and then print out that sound name to the console. Because what we're going to do after we get that new number is we're going to update our play sound function. Ready? Pause. Give it a shot. And resume. Let's see how you did. So now to generate a non-repeating sound number, it's going to be similar to what we did with message and image. And in fact, what message does is it uses the message.count in order to find out the upper limit of the random number it should be generating. But we've got a value in here for the total number of images that we use for sound. And since we're reading in a sound file, it's going to be very similar to reading in an image. Well, we'll use this code here because this is almost a perfect match for what we need. So I'm going to highlight this code. I'm going to copy it. And I'm just going to paste it down below and we'll make some changes. So first, instead of finding a new no image number, we're going to find a new sound number. Then we're going to go through and we're going to generate the new sound number inside of our repeat loop, which is going to be int.random in total number of sounds. But we don't have a total number of sounds yet. Now we declared this total number of images at the top of our code as a class-wide property. Let's go ahead and do the same for total number of sounds. So what we'll do is we'll add a value, let total number of sounds equal and for me, it's going to be six because there are six sounds in my asset catalog. And then down here in our number code, I'm going to say total number of sounds instead of total number of images. And make sure that you subtract one. Remember, we're zero indexed. And if you didn't zero index, then you'd be generating a number one larger than the number that you've used in your sound name. Now in our while condition, we want to make sure that we add new sound number down here instead of new image number. And the beginning of this while statement continues to refer to image number, but we want to create a sound number that keeps track of the current number of the sound that we're playing. And we do that at the top of our code. We create a class-wide property. So we'll say var sound number equals negative one, and it'll be negative one. So we make sure that we generate all the possibilities the first time we launch the app. Now down in the code we're writing to generate a unique sound number, we can get rid of the image view for this part. We've got the image view above, we'll keep that one here, but we certainly don't need to deal with image views when we're working with the sound number. And we can update that while clause so it now refers to sound number. In the line below that we'll keep track of the current number, so that should read sound number equals new sound number. And finally print to the console with print star 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 the new sound number is string interpolation sound number. Wonderful, let's build and run and see how it looks. And here we go. Clickety click click click. Yay! 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 Wonderful, yay, we're getting the numbers yay. that we expect down here. We can see that we have uh, the first value in our sound index, which is zero, the last one, which is five. Fantastic. Now let's head back to Xcode, stop the simulator, and hide the debug area, and it's time for another challenge. So now what we want to do is we want to modify the play sound function so that it accepts a single parameter, and we just learned how to do that. See, the goal here is to update play sound because right now it only plays sound zero. So we want you to update play sound so that you can accept a string and use that to play any file. This parameter should be a string with the name name. Then we should call play sound by passing in a file name of a randomly chosen non-repeating sound file name. But the way that we update play sound, we want to make sure that it's generic enough so that we can pass in and play any sound name as long as it's a valid string representing a file that's in the asset catalog. Ready to give it a try? Pause. And resume. Let's see how you did. So up first, play sound is now going to accept a string, and we're going to call that string name. So in between the parentheses, we put name colon string. Then we're going to take this value name, and we're going to use it to replace the string literal that said sound zero. So it's right inside here where we set up the data asset. 
And that is literally all we need to do with the play sound function to get it to work with a single parameter. Now let's scroll down to where we call the old play sound function, backspace over the two parentheses, and I'm going to let code completion tell me what's new about the function. Sure enough, we see the method pops up, and now play sound has a name parameter that you pass in that accepts a string. So let's press return and accept that. And so what do we pass in as the parameter here? Well, we're going to pass in a string, and the start of the string is sound, and then string interpolation and sound number, which is the random number for our sound file. That's it! So let's build and run and then start clicking so that we can enjoy the dulcet tones of your app. Yay! All right, this is working great. We've got one more function we want to write and we're going to introduce one more concept. So no one writes pristine, perfectly organized code the first time they sit down at their keyboard. Everyone goes through and tweaks and reorganizes. That process is typically referred to as refactoring. Refactoring is rewriting computer code for more efficiency, readability, and maintainability without altering the underlying execution or results. And most often when you're doing this, you're writing new functions. You're compartmentalizing things that you've done in your code to try to make things better. Now you'll hear some folks in computer science refer to the principle of DRY, don't repeat yourself. And that's a good tenet to keep in mind as you're taking a look through your code. Am I repeating myself? And if I'm repeating myself, is there an opportunity to break stuff out into a separate function that'll make my code easier to maintain and more readable? We've got an opportunity for that right now, and this is gonna be the last function that we write in our challenge. So if we take a look at our code, we've got a block of code that generates a new message, a block of code that generates a new image, and a block of code that generates a new number. And these things do the same thing, they just have different values going into them. So message.count minus one, total number of images minus one, and total number of sounds minus one is the upper bounds of the values that we're considering when generating a random number. Then we generate a random number. Then we assign it to the current number. Well, here is our opportunity to be able to consolidate this and try to write one piece of code that can do all of this. Yes, Swift students, it's refactor time. So noting this opportunity for refactoring, here is your challenge. Refactor your code DRY style to create a new function to generate non-repeating random values. Name the function non-repeating random. The function should have two parameter values. One, a value named original number, which represents the current message number, image number, or sound number. And two, a value named upper bounds, which represents the maximum of any random number that can be generated. The function should return a random int between zero and upper bounds, and use that return value to update the message number, image number, or sound number that was used to call the function. You're up for the task. Pause. Work through it and resume. Let's see how you did. All right, let's get refactoring. And we'll write this new function non-repeating random in between play sound and message button pressed. So I'll say func non-repeating random, I'll open and close parens, and then add my curlies. But we've got two values we're passing into this function. One original number, which is an int. The other upper limit, which is an int as well. Make sure that you got colons in there separating the value from the type. Make sure that you got a comma in there separating these two parameters. Now I'm gonna highlight these four lines of code that are used to generate a random message. I'm gonna copy them and paste them in between the curlies. I'm gonna change this value new message number to something a little more generic, new number. And I'm gonna replace that so that it's now in the repeat loop. And also in the statement in the repeat loop, I'm gonna replace messages.count minus one with upper limit. Now this while clause should read while original number equals equals new number. So at this point, new number is a non-repeating random, so we need to return new number. And if we're gonna return a value, what do we need to do? After the parentheses in the function definition, we need to type in the arrow and the value of the type that we're returning, which is arrow int. There we go. Now let's replace these four lines I've just highlighted with your magnificent refactoring. And I'm gonna put the function called just above these lines so that we can compare it against the four lines we're replacing. We'll say message number equals, then call our function non-repeating random. And the values we pass in will be message number for the original number and messages.count minus one for the upper limit. And if we take a look, I misspoke. We are not just getting rid of four lines, we are getting rid of five lines. Because what we're doing in this message number equals non-repeating is we're returning the value for the new non-repeating number. So we're replacing this line message number equals new message number. Let's backspace and delete the whole thing. Boy, that feels good. 
In fact, it felt so good. Let's repeat it two times. We'll get rid of all of this code in image number and we'll say image number equals non-repeating number. The original number is image number. The upper limit is total number of images minus one. We're gonna do the same thing down here with sound number. Highlight those four lines backspace and get rid of them. Then we're gonna set sound number equal to not repeating random. Our original number is gonna be sound number. Our upper limit is gonna be total number of sounds minus one. We have finished. Nice refactoring. Build and run and let's marvel at your results. And I will echo those cheers because you are now fantastic with functions. You've learned not only how to create functions, but how to pass in one parameter, multiple parameters, how to get a return value back, and you've refactored your code. As George Clinton himself would say, Funkadelic.